Um, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Jana. I'm our guest services specialist here at the museum. I am going to start with a couple of disclaimers. Disclaimer number one, I know we advertise it as early Frisco edition. As you can see, I've changed it a little bit. Um, it was very hard to find information on women in the late 1800s and the early 1900s in Frisco and Summit County as a whole. For some reason, we are just missing, whether it be photos or documents, it's just really, really hard, no matter how deeply we dug, to find things. So I had to expand it to Summit County um, in order to keep with all the single ladies. Now, I am gonna say it's all the single ladies, because a couple of these women were widowers or divorced. But I'm gonna talk about the contributions that they made while they were single. I'll give you some context while they're married, because it's good to know their stories. Um, and lastly but not least, we know that a few of these women died pretty recently in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and so often we have people who come here who might have known these women. Please understand that all the research I have is off of either their journals, first-hand accounts, or newspaper articles. If you have stories, please give me your information so we can record them and document them and add them to their files. Um, because we are always open to growing and expanding upon what we have right now. So... The very first woman we have, remember I mentioned it, it can be hard to find photos, Jane Torkington. Nobody had photos of Jane, um, which is really incredible considering how much she did for Summit County as a whole. She wasn't born in Colorado. She was actually born in Illinois in 1890. And after a few years, her family moved to Kansas. However, by 1899, when she was nine years old, her family moved to Breckenridge. And she grew up going to the Breckenridge schools and she had a near perfect attendance record, which in any day and age was something very difficult to accomplish. Um, now she, from an early age, was introduced to both social and government components of Summit County as both her older brother and her father were heavily involved in the local government. Um, so by 1910, after she finishes school, she ends up becoming a chief operator at the Breckenridge Telephone Exchange. This is her introduction, I know. What a unique job to have. Um, but by 1912, as you can probably see in a couple of these, she ran for the county superintendent of the schools and was elected and was very successful. That first article on the top left, um, I believe, was from the Summit County Journal. And it's a very, very positive political <laughs> article, especially for early 1900s. Um, pretty much says she's popular, she's going to do the great job, she's going to be super successful. We've known her, her entire life and we have full confidence in her, which is just... Um, so she actually continued to get reelected. She was superintendent of the schools for four years in second grade, from 1912 to 1916. Now the job of a superintendent back then was not horribly different than it is today. Um, some of her job duties included responsibilities for financial reports, she administered exams for teachers and students alike. Um, she recruited teachers. She visited schools. She attended conferences. She was also in charge of student success in the county. Um, so in 1914, one of the biggest things that she did, we did not have a library in Summit County for many, many, many years. But in 1914, Jane said, well, you know what? I'm going to make one for the schools. And she approved the creation of a library card and a library for the local high schools. Um, so that they could have access to these books. Um, obviously, as I said, she attended conferences, she traveled all around the county and states for meetings to check up on schools, to do all these different things. Um, and in 1920, um, obviously after her term was done, she was listed as a stenographer with the Express Company over in Breckenridge. Um, she worked for them for quite a while, and they actually ended up moving her to Denver after a few years. Um, but she was super, while she was up here, as I mentioned, they've known her her whole life, she was really, really into parties and bowling um, and playing cards, which was very popular in the early 1900s. Um, after she lived in Denver for a few years, she actually ended up moving to LA to become a clerk, um, which is where she stayed until she passed away in 1969. Now, I say this, and she never once buried. She was single for her entire life, and is the reason that we have a library system in our schools here in Summit County, which is absolutely incredible. She is buried at Valley Brook in Breckenridge next to her family, um, next to her brother, her parents, and I believe her nephew. Um, so you can still visit her here today. Now the next person I'm going to talk about is Miss Helen Rich. Has anyone heard of Helen Rich yet? No? Fabulous. 
So Helen Rich um, was born in 1894 in the August of that year. Um, she was actually born in Minnesota. It's a very common theme you'll see with a lot of these ladies that they did not get born up here in Colorado in Summit County, but they moved here when they were young um, or younger. Um, now Helen Rich actually studied to become a teacher. But while she was studying, she fell in love with writing. Um, and she ended up um, in Wisconsin um, as a writer. And she was encouraged by a man named St. Clair Lewis. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with him? He was a big fan of hers. He was the first writer from the United States to win a Nobel Prize. Um, and he really encouraged her to follow her writing. So she became a reporter in Stock, um, which is where they met. And then she moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where she continued to work as a reporter. Um, this is in the room. <laughs> um, now, at some point, Miss Rich did receive a diagnosis um, for tuberculosis, and as was popular in that day and age, moved to Colorado Springs in order to recover. Um, they didn't know until later that it was actually a misdiagnosis. Um, she didn't have tuberculosis at all. But Colorado Springs and Colorado Mountain Air always helps everyone feel better. That's a bit of her. Um, and Colorado Springs um, was where she started to feel better, and she used that to decide to become a reporter once again. She was actually the very first female reporter for the Colorado Springs Telegraph. Now, being a woman, they expected her to write about parties and social events. And as you can imagine, that was not exactly her cup of tea. <laughs> so she instead became a crime reporter and was the top crime reporter for the Colorado Springs Telegram. <laughs> she very quickly changed their minds. Um, eventually, she decided she wanted to become a freelance writer for a little while and just used her money, traveled all the way as far as France, and lived there until her money ran out. Um, she came back to the U.S. She moved to New York for a little bit before deciding to return to Colorado Springs. Um, where she met a woman named Belle Tuchel. Now, Belle was born, again, not in Colorado, Belle was born in Hamilton, New York, um, in 1881, and her family actually moved to Colorado Springs when she was nine because her father needed it for his health. Yeah, it's a very common theme for coming out this way. Um, now she always loved poetry, and she actually wrote her first poem at the age of nine years old. Um, and I believe it is published somewhere. Down. Um, now, when she graduated high school, she actually returned to New York for a bit to attend Vassar College, um, where she stayed for a few years to teach English before returning to Colorado Springs to teach English and Latin and poetry. And before long, she was actually the head of the English department, um, as you can imagine, it's a pretty coveted position. Now, she was this position until 1936, when she retired. Now, frequently in the summers, Helen and Belle would come up to, I guess, the Ridge is good at Summit County, Frisco! <laughs> and they loved it up here. Um, so they actually ended up deciding in 1936 when Belle was retired to, re or, well, they moved in 1937. Um, she retired in 1936, so that was the year they decided, we're going to move to Frisco. So they moved up here um, in 1937. And after a couple of years of living in Frisco, they ended up purchasing a house in Breckenridge. Um, they actually became known as the Ladies of French Street. Now, the reason that they did this was because when they met, they discovered they each had a severe love for writing um, and exploring the mountains, and they wanted to be able to just kind of sit in the cabin and write all the time. They were very similar people. Um, so when they bought this cabin, I will say, again, this is probably in the early 1950s, they had no plumbing, they had no electricity, um, and they lived off the land. Um, they frequently joked about it because you don't really learn how to do those things when you get an English degree. Um, so together they worked uh, to chop wood and to deal with frozen pipes and all of the super fun problems that come with life. Um, now when they first got to Brack, even though their intention was to just sit and write, um, Belle actually spent some time teaching and Helen ended up getting a job as a social worker. Um, eventually, Belle became a typist um, for World War II um, prices and rationing, um, which has kind of fallen back somewhere to her reporter uh, positions. Um, she only worked part-time, but with that part-time, she made the equivalent of about $21,000 a year, which is pretty incredible. She's in the <laughs> um, Now, eventually, she did resign to actually focus on her writing and her poetry the way that she wanted to. 
Helen and Belle, like I said, were both writers. Belle was the first one to get officially published with a book. Um, it was a book of poetry about love and hardship in the Colorado mountains. It was published in 1930. Um, Helen's first book was published just a few years later in 1947. Um, and then her second book was in 1950. Both of those books were about the Colorado mountains and shared stories about what life was like in a Colorado mining town. Um, both about love and family and the hardships of being up here. Um, Bell was published them again in 1953, 1957, and 1968. Again, all about Colorado mining and families and the people who lived up here. She actually won multiple awards for excellent poetry because of these books. She did write several unpublished short stories and poems. Um, and very similar, Helen was also writing a book about the legend of Silver Heroes. Yeah. So for those, I'm seeing a couple of no's. For the legend of Silver Heroes, it's essentially about a dance girl who comes down, comes out of nowhere, and heals some local miners of smallpox and then disappears. Um, that book is also unpublished, unfortunately, so we don't have it today. Um, Belle's focus with her poetry and with her novels, she actually wrote romance novels. And people would ask her, how could a maiden lady possibly know anything about romance? And she would always respond with, well, I can read, can't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, they loved the winter snow. Belle was a very uh, prominent supporter of the local fire departments. Um, and she was usually the one that ended up chopping the wood for their cabin. Um, she is in this picture on the left-hand side. Um, she often wore men's slacks and coats. Um, she usually had a French beret or a clean skip cap. I know we don't have her in this photo. Um, and as you can see, she has her Saturday evening post delivery cap. She was seen all the time. Um, in hers, she either had manuscripts or books, which is the most common, and on occasion, <laughs> slightly necessary. Um, now, the two of them actually ended up hosting picnics for other artists and writers that were local or traveling through town because that was a big part of what they wanted to do when they came out here. Um, Belle, is anyone familiar with uh, Feasters? Where did Mark Feaster? Mark was our town historian for quite some time. Um, the Feaster Preserve is named after the two of them. Um, and he also is the reason the Father Daughter Church is there. Um, totally separate story. Um, highly recommend looking into them at a different time. Uh, but he wrote a couple books and the feasters and Belle became really good friends and Belle helped him to write some of these books. Um, now, a lot of locals do remember going over to their house and playing with poker and drinking bourbon was another thing that they were very well known for. <laughs> um, now, they also were known Belle always had a spotty dog. Couldn't find any pictures of it, but she was known for always having a spotty dog. Um, Belle passed away um, at the age of 80 years old in 1970, and Helen followed not long after, um, almost exactly a year later in 1971. Uh, they are buried in Breckenridge, and they are directly next to each other. Um, and again, neither of them ever married. Um, they were roommates. I can't say things for sure. Um, <laughs> but the reason they're so important, not just to sign up at Frisco, is because they helped share the stories of life up here and how hard it was and what mining was like, especially during that time frame. I mentioned we're missing a lot of mid-century history. They covered a fair bit of that ground, which is really, really helpful to us to this day. Now, the next lady that I'm going to talk about, if you've probably heard before, and probably heard me talk about her, James Thomas. Has anyone heard about Bill's Ranch? This is his mom. She's the reason Bill's Ranch exists. <laughs> Now you must be thinking, Jenna, she didn't have kids, so she was married. Why is she with all the single ladies? Remember I said single? She spent about half of her life single. Um, her husband, John, passed away in 1900. Um, so she was left alone with the hotel that they were running on Frisco Main Street and three children. Now Jane was known as a pint-sized powerhouse. You might be able to tell from the photo on the right, but she was about 410. Um, but she was one tough cookie. Uh, their hotel was surrounded by saloons. And as you can imagine, bar girls. And Shane was usually the one who would go next door and break them up. 
There was one in particular that people actually recalled, we have it in our documents, that a knife came out and there was stabbing. Um, and nobody in the bar wanted to break it up and Jane just kind of came storming in, took care of the situation and then went back next door. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, one winter, is anyone familiar with Mason Town? Mason Town, awesome. It's about halfway up Mount Royal. Um, there was a big blizzard happening and this man came down from Mason Town in search of a doctor. Back in that day, we didn't have a doctor in Frisco or Summit full time. You usually got doctors traveling to town, you had to make their appointments when they came through. And when he came down, they were like, sorry, there's no doctor. And you know, everyone's asking, what's going on? He's working with Dr. Sleep. So what does Jane do? She rolls up her sleeves, hikes up Mount Royal in a blizzard, and helps deliver healthy kids. So she was a fabulous woman. She was very quickly called the most loved lady of Frisco and Um Everybody loved her. She was actually born in Wales. I should have mentioned that. Another one not born in Colorado. And the reason she stayed, she came out to Georgetown to visit her sister and met <laughs> John Thomas. They both had the same name, no relation. Um, <laughs> and they married, um, had a couple kids there before they ended up moving to Frisco to purchase that hotel that was on Main Street. Um, is that now, the same hotel as in It is not. That is an excellent question. It was the Laner Hotel, which is where Greco's is currently. Um, the Laner Hotel was later purchased by a woman called Evelyn Mix, and it's on the Bills Ranch property. Um, she took the two stories and made it an L shape and turned it into what's called the Ofer Lodge. It's now privately owned by the Wills. Um, <laughs> they're wonderful. Um, but it's still standing, just not in its previous location and previous condition. Um, and the reason they bought it was because it was so cheap um, at the time. The people who had created the hotel literally wanted to be an owner rather than running it. Um, and so after a few years, the roof collapsed and things just started becoming really dilapidated and he never fixed it so he sold it for the back taxes which in our money today is about six hundred and thirty four dollars so if you can imagine even having to fix a roof that's nothing <laughs> um so that was their whole reason for even moving up this way was because they saw the opportunity now in 1905 five years after john's passing jane applied for something called the 1862 homestead act which granted people about 140 acres and the rules were that you had to live on it consistently for five years and have at least one structure. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there were a lot of women, especially up in Summit County, that applied and had homesteads, Jane being one of them. The homestead was officially granted to her in 1910. At this point, she's had it for five years. She's lived on the land. Her whole family's there. And the reason she did it is because business at the hotel had started to slow down. And she needed a way to support her family. She had three kids. Um, and she wanted to make sure everyone had a way to keep her on, because that's just what Jane did. Um, she also helped take care of some of the neighborhood kids. There was a family called the Lindquists, and their mother passed away at a very early age, so she would all, often help take care of them. Um, one of the kids who was somewhat raised by Jane mentioned that while her sisters did the mothering, Jane took care of her sisters took care of them, Jane did the mothering. Um, Jane was the one to fix all their boo-boos, and she distinctly remembers one time well, she was with Jane and she was with her father um, and she accidentally inhaled a whistle and started choking on it. And her father started panicking and was running for the phone to call a doctor. Yeah. It's not going to do much because um, the doctor who was here at the time was down in Old Dillon and to get here by buggy, it's, it's, it's going to be a while. Um, so Jane went over and her name was Ida and she picked Ida up by her ankle and just started shaking her until the whistle came out. <laughs> and she was fine. <laughs> um, and the end of Ida's description of the story, she wrote, yeah, I loved her. <laughs> so Jane was a really fabulous woman. She did, she did quite a bit. Um, she stayed around town. She rotated between here and Steamboat Springs to visit her daughter. Once her daughter became a nurse, she helped her out over there for a little bit. Um, she ended up passing away in 1937 at the age of 84. Uh, 1937 was also the last year that the train came through Frisco, and so everyone in town used to say that she waited to hitch a ride on the last passenger car. And you can find her, her buried in cemetery, in the, excuse me, in the Frisco Cemetery. Her grave is still there along with a lot of the Thompsons. So, the reason, partially, that I talked about Jane um, is to also introduce Marie Nemeth, and someone else I'll be talking about in just a moment. 
um, who ended up living on Bill's ranch. Now, to talk about Jane and Bill and how that came to be, in 1914, Bill got married. I think they got married, um, and she deeded them the land. At this point, she's in her 60s, and she's like, I'm done. You're good. Uh, so she deeds them the land, um, and that was about 1930 was when he and Walter came up with the idea to send a letter called the D. Mr. Man Letter to bring people to build cabins up on their property because in 1930, we had a population of 18 people. It was five ranching families. You can't sell theory to other ranching families. It doesn't work. So they wanted to have people to come up and stay on their property and sell them eggs and cream and milk. Um, and Marie Nemeth and her husband, Max, actually ended up being some of those people. So Marie was actually born in 1902 in Germany, um, but she grew up in Nebraska, which is where she's buried today. She's in York, Nebraska. Now she built a, ca a cabin with her husband, Max, like I said, it's pictured here. They were 29 at the time, and not very long after they got divorced. Um, in very rare occurrence, Marie got to keep uh, which happened a lot, as you'll hear up here, that when women got divorced, they ended up keeping um, now she was known to everybody as Aunt Marie, and this is actually a picture of her with her great grandnephew Zach, who she named. Um, I thought it was very fitting considering that she was in this. Now she loved the color red. You can even see it on her shirt in this book in this photo. Um, and as you can imagine, being on a dairy farm, there are bulls. There are a lot of stories of Marie getting chased by bulls whenever she wore red, which was most of the time. Um, <laughs> She um, always wore her plaid, plaid shirt and her brown slacks um, and walking shoes. Um, she absolutely loved to walk around here. She loved the wildflowers. She loved to go to Rainbow Lake. She loved to just hike around Mason Town and walk on the ranch. She's also known for having a pet squirrel named Elmer, of which there were many generations. <laughs> All named Elmer. Um, but her cabin became kind of a community space for everybody. At the end of the day, they'd come to her house and they'd sit by the fire and they'd roast marshmallows and they'd tell stories and she'd share stories with them. Um, and she also loved to listen to, again, no TV, so radio, the Denver Fair Games. Um, that was a little <laughs> game team down in Denver. And so people would come to her house and they'd all go <coughs> baseball together. Um, she was sick for a while near the end of her life um, and ended up passing in 1991 down in Denver, um, but she is to this day survived by nieces and nephews, god godchildren, and of course, I believe the great grandnephew would still come because um, this photo was taken in the 70s, just about. Another person um, who lived on Bill's ranch and whose house also became very communal is her name is officially Estella Grace Cook when she was born, but she went by Grace Maddie. Maddie was her married name. Um, she was born um, in 1897 in Kansas, um, and she had quite a few siblings. She did grow up there and ended up graduating high school in 1917, where she went on to teach at a one-room schoolhouse. Um, she got a Bachelor's of Science in 1924. She went to uh, college, still in Kansas, I believe, um, before she ended up deciding to get married, because the same exact year she graduated, was also the year that she met her husband. Um, they got rather married rather quickly. <laughs> um, she was teaching um, in Seabrook, Colorado, which is way on the east side of Denver because they moved there initially, um, before they were able to procure a house in Denver. Um, the place that they purchased was actually on West 32nd, um, so pretty good spot to be in. Um, she became a member of Reverend Dex Hanger's congregation. So if you know the story of Bill's Ranch, you'll know that he was the man to get the letter and say, let's see if this is real or not, and brought a few other families with him. He said, we'll go up to the mountains, and if this offer is real, hey, we're going to have it. If this offer is not real, we had a lovely trip. We'll go back <laughs> um, So she became a member of his cabin, and they followed him up here to build a cabin on Bill's ranch. Um, she actually ran a dorm for one of the high schools in Denver from 1930 to 1936. Um, while her husband was superintendent of schools in Holyoke. Now, in 1936, she decided to complete a six-week photography class at the Chicago School of Photography, and they purchased a studio down in Idaho Springs. Um, so someone had a studio that was up for sale, and she said, yeah, I think I'll do that. Um, but it was also not long after that she divorced her husband, and yeah, this was in the um, 
she also was able to purchase a home in Idaho Springs, so she got somewhere to stay when she went down there. Um, and she was pretty much in charge of her own self. She had to heat herself with her pot belly stove, so she had to bring in wood and coal. She had to empty the ashes because, again, central heating was not exactly a thing in the early 1930s. Um, but their cabin up here was so important for so many reasons. Um, it became a real communal place for the Cook family, um, which again was her maiden name. Um, they used to call it the Pick and Shovel Inn or the Maddie's Cook Shack, depending on who was around. Um, they had no electricity and no running water until the 1980s, and it didn't have a bathroom or a real kitchen until 1993 when it had already left the family. Um, so you can imagine it was a lot of fun because they often had quite a few people there. So much so that you'd have family members tenting around the house because they didn't all fit inside. Um, but they all remember it fondly, and they, I think one of the articles or journal pieces that I read, um, one of the family members said, even though it's not in the family in, anymore, it will still be in the family in our hearts forever. And that was really sweet. Um, they usually used it, again, in the summer, but they used it to celebrate the end of the harvest season. Um, they were coming up from the city. And they used to go up to Rock Creek, which is just north of Silverthorne, um, I believe. And they used to do fishing trips. And there was one story in particular that I thought was pretty interesting, um, where they had gone on this fishing trip, and Grace and a lot of the women had gone down to the bottom of the creek, and the men had gone off to a different area to go fishing. And one of the bulls in the local ranch had gotten loose and came towards them. And it seemed very menacing to them. Um, so they ended up sitting down and hiding behind the log. And the woman who recalled the stories that we were panicking, we were crying, we were freaking out. Grace is telling us to kill, just be quiet. The bull came over anyway and started sniffing at them. And there was, she said there was drool dripping down from the bull. And she said, we were all freaking out. We didn't know what to do. And Miss Grace Maddie stood up, turned around, and said, shoot. <laughs> and the bull jumped, turned around, and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't see it again for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that story. <laughs> um, they also recall fondly hiking up to Peak One from the cabin every summer. They said every Cook family member has done it at least once, and we hope that even without the cabin, generations to come continue that tradition. Um, they also remember picking lots of raspberries up here. So they said it was very rare that you had an evening in the cabin that was not accompanied by raspberry pie and canasta. Um, <laughs> so most of the photos go back to her business um, were actually of Frisco and all the views she had from her cabin and life up here and living in the mountains and the Alpen Glow. I mean, a lot of the things we have today but with a little less photos. Um, <laughs> she also ended up having a lot of local high school photo shoots and newspaper shots. Um, she was on call 24-7 in case of any accidents to come and take photos. She ended up getting the first photo um, of a snowplow on Mount Evans, um, which later became a postcard. <laughs> um, in terms of personal life, she said, I work hard and I play hard. She loved to ski Birdtown Pass long before there was any kind of ski toes over there. Um, she used to backpack and fish in the Bull Range all of the time, especially in the summer. Um, but even so, she still enjoyed crocheting and sewing. Um, now, she wore the same outfit to any banquet she attended. She frequently was invited to a high school banquet, so she took all their senior photos. Um, she was known for wearing a princess style dress with black and white plaid and uh, large patch pockets lined with red taffeta. It's a very particular outfit. Um, <laughs> um, in 1962, um, in her right eye, she had a blood vessel that popped um, and she lost sight in that eye. And then in 1969, her left eye, she had to have a cataract removed. So you can imagine it's kind of hard to be a photographer if you can't see very well. So she retired in 1970 and instead chose to focus on her family and gardening and crocheting and sitting in her rocker. Um, she actually, by the time we got her story in 1985, one of the things she said is, I've had several heart attacks, but I seem better now. <laughs> and in 1987, she passed away. And I know these photos are a little hard to see, um, the two in the middle especially, but I thought they were too cool not to include. The second one was her with one of her falls from one of her backcountry fishing trips. Um, you can see there's some fish in front of her and also on the stream. And this one, she's doing like the full Captain Morgan and she's chugging something. Um, and I thought that this was very telling of her character. And then this is actually her in her studio developing some photographs. Now last, and certainly not least, 
Miss Susan Badger. Now, Miss Susan Badger was born in Augusta, Maine in July of 1886. And she grew up, and these are her words, with a staunch Republican Episcopalian background. And she was frequently trying to escape her family, essentially. She called herself a fugitive of her ancestors. Um, and I'll tell you why, <laughs> other than the background. Her grandfather was Lot M. Merrill, which I know is probably not a familiar name, but he was the governor of Maine three times in a row. And he was a U.S. Senator during the Civil War, who was also the Secretary of Treasury under President Grant. So kind of a big deal. Um, and back home in Maine, people only recognized her for her relation to her family. Now, she also um, had been ill for about 10 years um, and did receive a tuberculosis diagnosis eventually. Um, but she had an aunt living in Colorado Springs. So her aunt said, why don't you come over to my place, get some rest, feel better. Um, you know, the air out here is great, you can do it. She said, okay. So she got her diagnosis actually when she came out to Colorado, even though she'd been sick for about 10 years. And at one point it had gotten so bad that she was bedridden for about two years um, while she was out here, which made it very difficult to do a lot of things. And she did not have a good time of that. Now, once Ms. Badger's health improved, um, she actually worked as a headmistress for the San Luis School down in Colorado Springs. She worked there for about 14 years. However, she spent almost every single summer coming up to Frisco. Now, in 1934, she decided she was going to move to Frisco. She ended up boarding with the widow of a minor um, up until she bought a home in 1935, which was located on Granite. Um, yeah, no, Granite on this side. Sorry, right, Galena then. I always do that. Um, <laughs> located on Galena, the other side of the railroad tracks. Um, now in 1936, she was hired as a welfare director. She had absolutely no experience whatsoever. But she was highly recommended by a clergyman that she met in the Springs. Um, very, very quickly, she was known as one of the best welfare workers in the state. Um, she really wanted to run an employment office. And the county actually told her, sorry, Summit is too small. We don't want to fund one. It's too small. We can't justify it. So she actually, um, oh, and the head of employment services also believed that anybody on welfare was a riffraff. That was their opinion. So, um, so she decided to convince him to let her run an employment office without charges. She said, I'm going to be a welfare department that also handles unemployment. And you know what? They said it was fine. We don't have to pay you for it. You can do it. Now, when it came to welfare, people came to her to apply. The very first thing she did was register them on the job list. And then she let them stay on welfare until they were able to find a job. She worked really hard to make sure that people of this county stayed employed. Um, she really believed the phrase exactly she said was, the mountain people don't want handouts. They want work. Um, so she worked really hard to do it. Now, I think if you remember earlier, I mentioned Helen Rich who worked as a social worker for Miss Susan Badger. Um, she actually ended up writing a couple of articles about Miss Badger as well, and that's where we get a lot of our direct information from. Um, now, the office that Miss Badger ran um, supplied workers to I-70 and the dam, and a lot of people actually credited her with keeping the county running during the Depression. So she really held us together for quite a while. Um, and if you notice, I'm not using her first name. Miss Badger did not use her first name. She was a very proper lady. You could not often see her outside of the house without a hat or gloves and in a dress, even when she went to go chop wood. Um, so I'm going to continue to respect her wishes and her not using her first name. Um, now, Miss Badger um, often works to change the mind of others. So you can see I have photographed here a set of cards, a royal flush, and the hand of poker. I know it's hard to tell in this photo, but this signature here is Helen Rich, and that one is Belle Turnbull. Um, we talked about a little earlier today. Now, in order to change some minds, um, there was a contractor who was extremely skeptical. He doubted that um, a woman could pick a good highway crew. So she pretty much bet him um, in a game of poker, and she bested him, and she got his confidence, um, and she framed her hand and kept it as a memento for having convinced him um, to, to allow her to do that. And, Obviously, he uh, found out he was in the wrong not too long after she applied, uh, sent some people his way. There was also an employer who asked for a crew of 10 different men, um, and he was super adamant that not a single one of them be on welfare. So she said, okay. And she sent him 10 men. 
And she came back at the end of the day and she asked how they were. And he told them, he told her, nine of them were great, but this one was just not good. I don't want him back. The one he didn't like was the only one not on welfare. So she changed his mind pretty, pretty quickly when she disclosed that at the end of the day. <laughs> Um, Ms. Badger was also frequently known for going above and beyond her regular job duties at the town and for the people of Summit County. I mean, the fact that she even fought to have an employment office as part of welfare is example number one. Um, many other examples that I have, um, she would often host any runaways um, because they were minors and you couldn't put them in jail because of their age. So she would host them until their parents were able to come and pick them up and get their son to sleep. Um, she loved kids. She visited schools a lot. Um, she, around the holidays, she was an extremely high demand to read the night before Christmas um, to all the kids. They always wanted her to be the one to come back to do it. Um, now, one thing about welfare, I don't really know how it works in this day and age, but back then it did not pay for doctor bills. It did not pay for classes. Um, it did not, especially for kids, they wouldn't do it. So what the PTA would do is the PTA would raise the money and Miss Badger would load up her car and take the kids down to Colorado Springs or Denver and they'd just like do it all one day. Um, and she didn't care about what the weather was. Um, if it was good weather, bad weather, she still did it. She still made sure they got to keep it going. Um, there was a really common story that I read through all the articles that I read about her, um, but there was a local in indigenous family um, that was unable to use welfare to pay for their baby's funeral. And of course, Ms. Badger found out about it. And she went and essentially convinced a carpenter to construct a small coffin. Um, she borrowed cotton from a doctor and she actually used um, her best white linen silk pajamas to line the coffin for the baby. Um, when nobody wanted to serve as justice of the peace for whatever reason, she volunteered to do it. Um, welfare employees technically could not hold any elective offices, so what they did is she convinced the town to appoint her and then did the work for free so that she could continue to keep that role, and she did it for 14 months, in addition to everything else she was already doing. Um, now, I mentioned earlier the county didn't have a library for quite some time, and before we had one, she actually hosted one out of her own private home on the honor system. Um, and when people would ask, you know, what are we going to do if they disappear, she said, it doesn't really matter. Um, she believed that the most important thing was that people get to read the books. Um, she was really a fabulous lady. Um, she was also known for always having a good cellar and keeping good bourbon in the house. <laughs> Very frequent theme around here. Um, she would drink scotch on her, porch, on her porch in the evening, so if you walk by her house, you usually see her outside. Um, and sometimes she was stopped by Dylan on her way to Breckenridge. Um, if she was going to see like a movie in Breckenridge, she was stopping Dylan to watch the street fights. Um, <laughs> apparently, a very common cool pastime for her. Um, she actually didn't retire until 1959, when she was 73 years old. Um, so, as a recap for all of the jobs that she had, she was our county welfare director, employment services representative, deputy sheriff at one point, humane officer, justice of the peace, and a Red Cross chairman. So she basically single-handedly held this down together at some point in her life. Um, she actually broke her hip in 1964, healed it, and then broke it again in 1967. So after she broke it the second time, um, they moved her to a nursing home over in Fairplay. And she was confined to her home over there. Um, she always used to say, even though it slowed her down, it didn't get her down. Um, she died um, at that nursing home in March of 19... I actually apologize, I can't date. It's 1972. Um, and that is the end of Miss Badger's life. She also was very well known for having a stuffy dog, so I had to include them in her clothes. Um, now I want to say the youngest woman that I have talked about today died at the age of 77. Three of the women died at the age of 90. So ladies, roll the story, stay single, live longer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does anybody have any <laughs> questions? <laughs>